two, one. Oh, we're back. We're live. Here we are at 5 p.m. in a special show here on Think Tech TV, Software for the Sciences, with Avram Goodblatt, who joins us from Philadelphia, which we are delighted to talk to Philadelphia. We have a big map in our office of all the places we talk to in Skype, and I don't think we've talked to anybody in Philadelphia before, so we'll have a red dot on Philadelphia in Pennsylvania today. Thank you for thank you for participating with us, Avram. Glad to be here. So uh, let me let me get a handle on exactly. Uh, oh, there you are. I can see you. Um, you know where you, where you are in your life uh, scientifically, and uh, where where it's going for you scientifically. So I understand you're in Philadelphia, and you're in biology, and you have a PhD in was it biochem? Um, nope. Um, you're thinking of somebody else. I do not have a PhD. My background originally was in computers, actually before that in math and physics. Um, and um, I was actually living in Maui until 2002. And at that point, I decided for career and personal issues to go to Philadelphia and work with some people at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. That was my first encounter with dealing well with, uh, shall we say, the non-hard uh, sciences. I had involved in math and physics before, but now I was suddenly involved with people in biomedical research. Mm -hmm. And it was fascinating, a whole different world for me. And um, at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, I was there for nine years. I uh, was given the task of developing a system for managing uh, what they call core facilities. Those are the shared large-scale facilities which might have very high-level microscopes, things they call flow cytometers, also genomics which provides services for different kinds of analysis, DNA and so forth. And um, my job was to help them all figure out how to manage their systems better and build the software for it. I did that until um, 2011 and then uh, last year I started working for a company for Stratacore who had developed similar but in my opinion far superior software to anything I had developed. Uh, an international team of people headquartered in Paris that provides software like this on the cloud to uh, universities and research institutions around the world all over Europe, North America, Australia, Singapore, and so forth. I work, I've worked with this company for uh, a little over a year now, but at the same time, I've been looking at ways to do what is more important to me than any of this, which is to go back to Hawaii. Um, we started the process this last year. My wife and I bought a condo in Kihei, which we're very happy with. We adopted a Shih Tzu from Maui, who now lives with us here. And well, that's a wants true to sign of commitment. Yes, exactly. My little doggy says to me every day with his big eyes, where's the beach? And I have no answer for him. <laughs> Philosophical so, question. The, um, so even though my background is in computers and math, and I'm applying it to biomedical research systems, um, I have to say seriously, my way of thinking over the last 10 years was very significantly affected by things I learned in Maui. Interesting. What I'd also like to talk about. It sounds kind of strange. Um, it's not like, they, like I asked all the people I work with to learn to surf or anything. It's rather that I looked at the issue of how do you get scientists and software developers and administrators to somehow talk together to figure out what's needed, because remember, management of a scientific enterprise involves the administration, but the software people have to develop it. And I found that uh, I kept harking back to what I had learned from colleagues of mine on Maui, which is the history of Hawaii over the last hundred years has been of multiple cultures learning to talk and coexist. And while it's not an exact mapping, you can't say that this ethnic group are the scientists and that ethnic group are the uh, computer programmers, but there's a similar problem. If 
you can't get the programmers and the scientists to sit and listen and respect each other, you don't get anywhere. And unfortunately, frequently, that is what happens because they talk in two different ways. Um, the reason Stratacor, and this is my opinion, of course, this is not Stratacor's policy, but I believe they would agree with my statement, um, which is the reason they have succeeded is because a lot of the people in Stratacor are scientists themselves who understand how science works and the day-to-day -day rhythm, activities, and workflows that go on in a scientific enterprise. That is the key to me to the problem of software for science, which is scientists, in a sense, have to design their own software. Yeah. They cannot the design to the software programmers which is frequently what happens. They either must design it themselves or they must be able to sit and talk with the software developers to explain to them carefully what's needed. That takes time. Well, haven't you noticed that a lot of them become software developers? And I have found that. You know, you have somebody who is in a, an area that's unrelated. You know, this is science that is, doesn't include software development and, and they don't have the resources available to them uh, to you know to find a developer uh, or to pay for the development of the software so they do it themselves uh, and I guess I would do that too if I was determined to finish my project uh, determined to make some headway I would sit down and learn how to do it and I think you know a lot of them say well it's not rocket science I'll just uh, read a book and learn how to code and I'll make the program and in the process, they become their own internal software developer. Don't you find that to be so? Not only have I found it to be so, I uh, wrote a blog post uh, a couple of years ago for a place in the UK called the Software Sustainability Institute, whose task is to help scientists around the world learn how to write their software so that it is sustainable and shareable. Uh, for a scientist to do something for him or herself is doable, but then someone else wants to use it. It requires a lot of work to make something that you've done for yourself shared with other people. So the thing is, most a lot of what you're referring to, I believe, has to do with very scientific-oriented software, which I agree is a very important enterprise. The area I was focusing on and that Stratacor focuses on is, is mostly administrative aspects of the scientific enterprise, which are also very important, but a different kind of thing. Uh, closely related, but different. And in that case, administrative software, by its very nature, has to be shared among many people. So if a, if a, if a, develop, if a scientist develops it just for himself, he won't do everything it needs because he doesn't stand alone in the kind of management area. Whereas if perhaps he's doing a specific program for his research, it would work for him. And there's a lot of that going on. I very much believe in the work of the Software Sustainability Institute as well. We're doing excellent workshops around the world, helping scientists learn how to bring up the level uh, of reliability and shareability of the software that they are developing. Well, let me take a short break, Avram. This is Avram Goodblatt. Uh, he's with Stratocore. He's uh, joining us by Skype uh, from Philadelphia uh, here on Think Tech Talk. And uh, we're talking about software for the sciences, which I'm finding is even more important than I thought. Uh, let's take a minute here uh, for a short break. We'll be right back. Mahalo for watching Think Tech Hawaii. We are a channel dedicated to raising public awareness about the importance of technology, energy, diversification, and globalism to the future of Hawaii. We broadcast and stream daily from 1 to 5 every weekday, and we broadcast on Olelo 54 and OC16 TV. All of our shows are archived on thinktechhawaii.com, and we hope to see you there. Aloha. Aloha. My name is Josh Green. I host a show called Healthcare in Hawaii here on ThinkTech. We get together once a week or sometimes uh, twice a month, depends when we're busy, we get together less often, but we love to see you here to talk about the preeminent health care issues in our state. Our programs vary very widely. We talk about economics, we talk about health care, we talk about social issues on this program. Thanks for joining us.
Aloha, I'm Kelee Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute. One of the things I love being, however, is the host of the weekly program on Think Tech Hawaii called Ehana Kako, which means let's work together. I get to interview movers and shakers in our town and across the world so that you and I together can learn and to grow. Please join me every Monday from 2 to 3 p.m. or watch us on the recording www.thinktechhawaii.com. Aloha and ehana kako. Let's work together. Aloha, my name is Kenneth Lawson. I'm your host here at Life in the Law. I'm really interested in law as I practiced it for 18 years before coming to Hawaii. I practiced criminal law and civil rights law on the mainland. Now I teach law at the University of Hawaii Law School, William S. Richardson School of Law. And I bring in guests who are very current on legal issues that affect your life here in Hawaii. Uh, come and join me every Wednesday at 1 p.m. as we explore how the law affects you, how the law is changing, and why it's important that you should care about what's going on in your community. See you then. Aloha, my name is Willow Chang Elion, and I host a show called The Art of Life. We air live every Friday from 2 to 3 p.m. And what we do is basically we focus on individuals who create a unique sense of place for Hawaii. These are movers and shakers, artists, innovators. They are also traditionalists. They're all involved in the archival process, and they make this place a unique place, one that makes Hawaii a richer place to be. I hope you do join us and certainly tell your friends about the show whether they live here or they live abroad it's a way to give back to our community. We're keeping it Pono. Hi I'm Jay Fidel. I'm host of uh, Hawaii the State of Clean Energy which is our flagship show which plays 4 to 5 p.m. every Wednesday and the, uh, the supporters of that show are uh, Hawaii Energy Policy Forum and uh, Hawaii Energy. And luckily enough, we have representatives of both of them right here today to tell you more about what they think about the show. Uh, Sharon Moriwaki at my left is uh, co-chair of Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, and she goes first. Sharon? Thank you. Thank you, Jay. I'm so glad that we have this Hawaii, the state of clean energy. This was uh, two years ago when we started this, and we have continued it because it's so important. And there's so many developments happening across the state. We hope you'll tune in every Wednesday, 4 to 5. It's wonderful. And uh, Ray is uh, Hawaii Energy. Ray, what is your thought about the same subject? Well, I, I agree completely with Sharon. Uh... Okay, we're back. We're live. My name is Jay Fidel. Here is, we're on ThinkTech TV. Um, and we're talking about software for the sciences, a very important topic, with Avram Goodblatt who is with Stratocore, and we, uh, we have him on uh, Skype Audio uh, in Philadelphia. Uh, Avram is, uh, is an expert in bringing software to the sciences, and then uh, he's going to come here and bring software to the sciences, we hope. So the, the question to follow in our, the last part of our discussion, Avram, was how do we make software that is used for the sciences reusable so that it can be used around the world, so that it meets certain ma maintenance, uh, you know, standards, and it's not arcane for the next guy who wants to use use and adapt it to his project. How do we do that? Is there an organization? Is Stratocore somebody who can do that? Stratocore specializes in management uh, software systems on the cloud, mostly for for um, research for managing research core facilities. Uh, it is a particular niche, but a very important one, and becoming more important as budgets are reduced in research, to be able to make more value out of the use of the equipment and the laboratories that exist. The Software Sustainability Institute that I mentioned deals in a broader area, not developing software, but helping scientists learn how to upgrade the value of what they're already doing. I want to return, however, to one more point that I haven't made yet, if I may, sure. which has to do with um, the kinds of management software in the sciences, which are also important. I'd like to make two key points about that. Mm -hmm. First of all, frequently uh, academic institutions, when they look for things that are to manage the science, they go to companies that have developed management software for industry. 
but it turns out that industry and academia don't work the same way. Scientists are supposed to be creating and developing new ideas. They are in the job of managing creativity. Companies, quite rightly, are mostly in the area of managing and control and being able to repeat and reliability. Yes. There are two different kinds of management, both valid, both important. Um, people like uh, Johnson at Stanford have written about this at length much better than I ever have. And the idea is, if you're managing science, you need to have regular command and control management work together productively with creativity management. Mm -hmm. That's the key goal in academic research institutions. And in many cases, it does not go that well. Because either the scientists have the upper hand, and they're not necessarily good at the reliable command and control part, or the administrators have the hand, and they don't really know what to do with the creative part. Um, different cultures, different approaches. Part of what I was talking about that I learned from the time in Maui, how do you get these cultures to work together? Yes. And, how do you do that? Uh, well, there are several ways, ways to do it. One way that I came up with, I call the Catalyzer Project which is to take specific scientists, and these can be grad students, they can be postdocs, who also have an affinity for design and specification of how they work. Mm -hmm. Not every scientist likes to do that. So the idea is, there's a, there's a lot of these people out there, and, and the younger guys, uh, the younger people are much more able to do this, I would say, because they grew up with the computer culture. Um, and the idea is to take people who know how the science works because they do it and help them learn how to think about it and write about it so that the software developers can then put it into a system. Um, like I said, not every postdoc can handle this, right. but I've met men who can, and when they've sat down and written out what they need, we've gotten a lot of productivity out of it because now we really get an idea of what's going on. It, and you're getting it, shall we see, from the horse's mouth, the guy actually doing the science. But they have not necessarily learned along the way the discipline of design and specification that's needed in order to take their ideas and put them onto something that can be communicated to a programmer. Yes. And that, to me, is the core piece that's missing. I would say every research institution could use several of these kinds of people. They probably have these people already within their institution, but just like what the Software Sustainability Institute does with scientists who write programs, we need to do with people who are working in the lab and understand the complexity of the workflows and things like clinical trials and how hard it is to get all the pieces to work together and map out what's needed to communicate to the development team and to the administrators. Well, who, so these, who, who is going to be at the center of this? I understand there's two ends, but who is going to be the, you call it the catalyzer, the synergizer? Who, is, is, this, uh, is this something a company uh, should do, or is it one side or the other side of the equation? Is it a third party? Is it outside the university altogether? Um, is it the computer science department? Of course, it all depends on the nature of the computer science department. There are very, very bunch around the world. Uh, Stratacore implicitly does this in the way that the software is developed for Stratacore. However, it cannot be done only by an outside company we have found that the more there's people on the ground who we can work with within each site, within each client, they get much better results. The more that people know what they need and how they work, the much easier it is to then get the PPMS, which is the Stratacore system, to then conform or be extended to meet their needs. But you can't, you can't always look inside someone's head. We don't all have the ability of doing the old Vulcan mind meld. 
Yeah. Instead, what we need are kinds of people within the research institutions who don't even necessarily write programs. But what they do instead is they can analyze their work and create the designs necessary to get their work to continue. Design here, I believe, is a key component. Well, you know, it strikes me that, <clears throat> in fact, I, I believe that Oceanit, which is a company here in Honolulu, a tech company, um, which has been involved in a number of uh, startup type projects and technology and science projects, um, you know, ha has been working on a drag and drop, uh, very simple interface in order to establish, you know, behind the screen, sophisticated code. And I don't know the status of their efforts in that regard, but it strikes me that if Stratacore or somebody else like that created a, um, you know, a drag and drop, very well thought out uh, drag and drop type interface, which would be easy to use, but would have a kind of leverage in terms of, you know, developing code behind the scenes, that, that, that anyone in the sciences, even without computer training, uh, might use that and generate code that would fit certain parameters. And then that code could go to, say, a, um, you know, a, a non-science management person or a uh, company, and he could, he could make it more universal. Um, what do you think about that? Has that been tried? I've heard of such projects. Um, I think they can be very useful. I see those things as a kind of part of the whole design process. How do you design what it is you want to accomplish before you even think about coding? Yeah. Or, for example, in the case of PPMS, it's an already built system that is highly customizable and configurable. <laughs> Deciding how you want to configure something also requires a design phase. And it's a phase that goes through cycle after cycle. You should never be happy with it. Every time you design it one way, you use it for a while, you're finding more things that you need to develop in it. Mm -hmm. So what I'm really trying to say is um, those issues are critical as well, how you design systems for the code. But I'm really saying, how do scientists get the work done that they need to get done? What are they trying to accomplish? What are the pieces and how they fit together? Um, I know from talking with people in Hawaii that there's been a major effort to take advantage of the fact that Hawaii has some unique populations that are valuable in clinical trials. True. In, in, the, uh, in the medicine area, we have some great diversity, and we can That's do right. clinical trials that would be very valuable to big pharma on the mainland. And so what's happened is and I believe the cancer center is heavily involved in, in bringing together the different medical institutions. I heard, and I don't know for a fact, but I believe even Kaiser might be involved in this, in order to be able to organize that clinical trial information on a more broad basis. But then you get down to the point of when you have a clinical trial, it means moving a lot of specimens and a lot of information amongst a lot of different people. How do you organize that whole kind of workflow? It gets very complex. Well, I know one guy at the medical school. He started out with um, having a big refrigerator full of blood and serum from a diverse population. <clears throat> and after a while, he realized, that, and he was selling this to Big Pharma um, on the mainland. And, and then after a while, he realized that he could actually uh, give Big Pharma even better information by making a big database and having you know thousands of fields, maybe tens of thousands of fields, describing exactly what the blood and serum was, and uh, and he could just uh, email them the database, and they would have you know the same benefit as they would if he airshipped the blood and serum, and so this has been a, a project for him, but <clears throat> it strikes me that uh, you know with a big database you can do more, much more uh, with this kind of science than uh, even with the actual samples. Yes. And this gives me a good opening to give you an example of where proper design is important. 
I was involved in a project with an institution, not with the University of Pennsylvania, not with Stratacor, uh, where they were collecting large amounts of information on samples and a, for a particular kind of cancer, and I was supposed to make sure that there was enough fields to properly signify the topology. After taking the way that they told me it needed to be designed and working on it for a while, they came back to me and said that it's useless. Why was it useless? Because the typologies that were used were developed for uh, doctors who were analyzing the pathologies of particular specimens for clinical work, but that the scientists doing the research needed different information. Mm. So that becomes a design issue. Yes. How do you get throughput of information from the beginning to the end that actually helps the people at the end, which is maybe different than the people at the beginning? These are complex systems of research that need to be designed and administered taking these things into account. The design of medical research systems is a key part of having good software to support it. Well, it strikes me that if you make a mistake in your design at the outset, <clears throat> and then you put in thousands of hours on the basis of a bad design, you get to the end and it doesn't do what you had hoped it would do, you've wasted an awful lot of time and money. That's why people try to do it more iterative with methodologies similar to agile methodologies where you're in constant development and redevelopment and testing of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. The old methods were more called waterfall methods where you come up with a specification, you, you work on it for six months or a year, you bring it to the people and say, here it is, do you want it? The agile methodologies, which became more popular over the last uh, 10 years, try to bring in more situation where you take an idea, you do a, a, a kind of prototype of it, check it out with the people that are going to use it, and then bring it around again and see if you're still where you want to be. But this takes, again, a lot of close communication between the people developing and the people using. Well, help, so, help me understand where, where all this, uh, you know, where the challenge is. Uh, I can see, uh, uh, you know, in fact, we hear about it all the time, large databases involving, you know, multiple relational databases or sub-databases and, and, and uh, databases with, with fields uh, in, you know, in enormous numbers. Um, and then I guess um, the reports would have to be designed so as to be useful, the processing and the reports. And then on the, on the beginning, the front end of it, you know, uh, entry screens, that would be useful. Um, using, you know, sensors, what have you, in order to put the data in in the first place. Uh, so where is the challenge? Is it in all, all those places, or is it particularly in the input, or in the processing, or in the report writing? Where, where do you run into trouble? Well, on computers, you can run into trouble everywhere. And <laughs> I don't want to trend to be an expert on everything in computers. I'm not. I've worked in a particular area that I know pretty well, but you can generalize to the fact that uh, if you're dealing with research, which is always dealing with something new, if you're not coming up with new ideas and new approaches in research, you're not really a researcher. You're just a factory worker, repeating the same thing each time. And if you want, again, to manage the complexity of ongoing new ideas and so forth, you have to deal with being able to link day-to-day -day regular management with the management of creativity. That, to me, is the key central issue. And you need people who are specializing in being able to talk in both worlds and understand both worlds sufficiently to act as a bridge. Those people exist. I've met many of them. They just need a niche by which they can do their work. In other words, the universities need to understand that such skills are important and that they should have a career path to support them. That a postgrad who decides to work as a catalyzer and understand how to design systems for biomedical research is as valid as one who's actually doing the research itself. Let me make a distinction between biomedical research and, and say, uh, ocean and earth science <clears throat> research. In the case of well, ocean and earth science, uh, you're not dealing with, um, you know, uh, medical, uh, medical numbers. You're dealing with um, something you find in the ocean, 
or don't. Right. You're dealing with animals out there in the ocean. You've taken lots of samples uh, in various places using lots of measuring, measuring equipment and sensors and what have you. Uh, and then you um, and do this on a very large-scale basis sometimes, involving enormous amounts of data. And then you have to have a, a really big computer to crunch that. And it'll come up with a map, for example, or some profound conclusion about what's happening and, and projecting off into the future about what will happen. Now, I know this is not the same as medical research, but uh, there's, there's got to be similarities. And I just wonder... Uh, to the extent that someone is 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 qualified um, to do to write or or maintain uh, software for medical biomedical research, would that same person be able to write and maintain um, software for ocean and earth science research or you know pure research, uh, which is not medical, uh, or or are you saying there's really two different fields here? What I'm saying is for anyone to be a successful software developer in either of these fields, and let's broaden even further, who uses even bigger databases? Uh, astrophysicists. They have large-scale international databases of all the celestial bodies that they somehow manage to coordinate. In each of these fields, the success of software development, in my opinion, depends on being able to work with people who know the field from the inside, who've done the research and understand the needs, and to work together as a team, an equal team, to develop it. And in many cases, this does happen. But you need the domain knowledge of what it's like to be in a creative scientific field together with the, computer, the, the skill to write the programs. And while it's possible for that to be found in one person, um, I believe we could accelerate the process by having the computer people and the, the science designers being able to both work together so that not every programmer needs to learn the science from its depth, because that's a lot of work. I mean, you're talking about a PhD who spent years studying his field, and you expect suddenly a computer scientist to understand all that. It's not fair. No. But you, you, know, you know one thing that we should talk about Avram, uh, is to get a handle on um, the, the, the cost of this uh, in manpower, uh, the cost in American money, the cost in time. So if I'm a, that PhD student and I'm working on something sophisticated and I say, you know, this is over my head with the software, I can't do this, I need help, I, I need somebody who can sort of translate what I'm doing into you know, other realms and make it useful for my collaborators and, and related sciences. Um, assuming I find somebody to do that, I, I'm going to have to find the resources to pay for that, which may not be in my original budget, which may be a problem if I'm operating on a small budget. I mean, what is it going to cost me, assuming I find somebody, uh, in terms of money and time to get the job done so that I will be able to realize my project? Well, the reality of, of what goes on does not match sometimes what people plan and think may go on. What people plan and think goes on frequently is, I have a problem, I'll hire a well-known software company to develop it for me, they'll figure out what I need, they'll write it up, they'll solve it, we're paying them money so they'll solve it properly and then we've taken care of the problem. Now, what actually happens in many cases is that the company does not necessarily understand what's needed, not necessarily because they don't put in the effort, but because the people explaining it to them don't understand what they need themselves and think the, the computer people are going to figure it out. In other words, they think that the systems analyst will understand their system and what they're about and do the hard work of figuring out their design. Each group thinking the other one is going to figure out what's needed. The computer people just want the scientists to say, here's what we want, do it. The scientists are thinking the computer people are going to say, we'll figure it out for you. And so the ball is dropped. Mm -hmm. So 
if you take into account how much money is wasted on these kinds of efforts, then the cost instead of paying these catalyzers on the science side to analyze and understand what's needed is much cheaper. But unfortunately, and uh, what I've seen happen in several cases, is where they tried the old route, hire an outside company, they'll figure out what's needed, they'll give it to us, everything will be fine. When that fails, nobody reports on how much money was spent. The failure is basically attributed to whatever cost, and it disappears somehow. So we never learn from that situation that if, let's say, we spent half a million dollars on a failed effort, but instead, if we hired a, cu a couple of people for $200,000, we could get something much better that would work for less money, you first have to understand that you're going to waste $500,000. The only way to find that out is to be able to talk to people who failed. But nobody discusses failures. So you never find out what the real, what they call TCO, total cost of ownership, what the real cost is of developing, maintaining, and building these systems. Mm -hmm. They're hidden in failures. Well, and so, I, I, I hear you saying, though, that somebody has to kind of monitor this and say, wait a minute, the scientists have to, you know, be spending more time on the design because they should know more about at least their side of the design than the software developers know. And if you want to have an efficient uh, software experience here, uh, they're going to have to actually, um, they, they can't abdicate. They have to be active in the, in the uh, organization right. of the design. But that, that means either A, the software company says, you guys are not working hard enough, or B, it's a, an arbiter, a mediator, who sits over both of them to make sure they're both making the appropriate contribution. Uh, and I suspect from what you say that, that, that the existence of that arbiter would be helpful. Right, but without, when I have attempted to be an arbiter in, in that situation, what I have found is that even when there is a scientist who has an affinity for working and designing these things, um, the administration, in many cases, does not appreciate the value of the work that he's doing sufficient to allow him time to do it. Because the concept does not exist as something, as, as a job classification, that as a task that's necessary. Instead, it is believed that you turn this whole thing over to the computer's analysts, and they'll deal with it, which is not fair to the computer people either. No, I, you know what, and what I get out of all of this is that if you do this right, you know, you, you stand a better chance at the efficient use of your grant, your research grant money, and right. uh, of, of achieving, you know, an outcome. If you do it wrong, you, sp you, sp you, you fritter away that money uh, on, on what amounts to a failure, and so the, the, the whole organization of this process is critical to the success of the research. Uh, and therefore, you know, we have to pay attention to it. And right. I expect that's one of the things you want to do in coming to Hawaii, at least on the biomedical side of things, to make sure that this can be done at scale for important projects, for projects that have collaborative effect elsewhere, if not globally, that, that the software that's written for them is, is done efficiently and, you know, uh, and, and, well, and well. Um, yeah. Tell me if I'm wrong about that. No, I would love to be able to do that in Hawaii. In some ways, Hawaii could be a fertile ground for that because of the fact that I don't want to make a generalization. You know, I'm not stepping off the plane and expecting there's going to be a whole line of hula um, performers waiting for me. But on the other hand, I have found, especially, you know, that people do take the time to listen more in Hawaii than perhaps in some, you know, very rushing uh, major metropolis, let's say, in the East Coast. People take the time to do things there, and they listen more. And believe it or not, that's a very valuable thing in, in research. But I don't think we give Hawaiian culture enough credit for being able to do that. You know, we don't, we, we're not New York. 
We're not Los Angeles. We're something different. And well, we, that, we, at the same time, we have to make this work. We have to think big. And sometimes Hawaiian, you know, Hawaiian style doesn't doesn't reach that. Uh, and, and and maybe there's something here in terms of sharing the benefits. I don't know what the business model is, but I would ask you when when you have this kind of collaboration, even a mediated and arbit an arbitrated type you know, with somebody sitting on the top and allocating the responsibility. Um, who gets the code? Who owns it? Uh, who has, who has the, um, you know, the copyright or the patent on it? Uh, and, and uh, you know, is there ever license given to the, the next guy who wants, the, who wants code that is similar for a similar project halfway around the world? I mean, it seems to me this is a, a global affair and that research these days, of course, is a global affair. Um, so that uh, these companies, companies like uh, Stratacor, want to have, should have, global effect. They should be talking in many languages, writing in many languages. They should be reaching everywhere. Uh, and they should make it easy for global collaboration to take place. But if, if that's the case, who owns the code? Do they own the code? Do they license? How does that work? Specifically in the case of Stratacore, um, Stratacore has to work in multiple languages. In the same day, I could be dealing with people in Quebec, in Germany, Italy, Spain, uh, and Australia in the same day. In response to the code, Stratacore owns its code. But unlike some other approaches, um, once an addition is made to a program, let's say a researcher in Australia comes up with an interesting need for the software, and he requests Stratacore, could you add this functionality? There'll be an analysis done, and if it's a straightforward addition that Stratacore believes has value around the world, they will add it in at no cost to the client other than the normal licensing fee for the software in general. They will then make that feature available to researchers around the world at no additional cost than the normal fee that they're already paying for the software. Mm -hmm. So in effect, what Stratica, even though Stratacor owns the code, they are providing a way for scientists around the world to indirectly, informally collaborate on building the system. In a sense, we're picking the brains of the best, most intelligent scientists regarding system design from everywhere, they provide us that knowledge for free, but then we build a system that they can then use at relatively low cost. It's, open, it's, open, it's like open source. We have the benefit of grassroots changes. Right, except that it's not open source. No, I understand. But it's open ideas. And so the thing is, because we spend our time listening to the scientists and saying, what do you need? And the people on the Stratacor team are either scientists or people who have spent a lot of time in science themselves, um, then they understand what the scientists are asking for. So it's really a collaborative development. You and know, we're doing academia, what academia does not have the wherewithal to do for itself, because as you know, um, the ability of large-scale academic projects to develop can be very challenging. There are such things. Mm -hmm. There's an interesting set of projects from the Kuali Foundation, which is headquartered in Indiana, which develops and manages community source projects from institutions that share around the world for different kinds of software, not necessarily anything to do with biomedical research, different kinds of software from around the world which is called community source, meaning the community that builds it owns it. It's not owned by a company, it's owned by the community of participants of institutions. Well, that's more like open source. Yes, it's closer to open source, it's not identical with it. Yeah. I believe this for all these kinds of things. I believe, obviously, you know, the systems that Stratacore uses are built frequently on Linux, which is, as you know, open source. The languages we use, some of them are open source languages. These things can and do coexist. Um, proprietary systems, open source systems, community source systems. 
the key to all of it working is the ability to have good communication and knowledge of good design. Um, well, you know, I know design I mean, this, this, it seems to me that we are in a kind of revolution here, and uh, that's what you really are speaking of. Because a few years ago, I think it was all, you know, uh, in isolated, isolated pockets, and now it's it's going global, and uh, you know, there's enormous power out there, and and having having code that was made for one institution, one project, and being able to reuse it, you know, a, a continent away. Um, so, uh, you know, something something fantastic is happening. Um, you know, I don't, I don't, my sense of it is it hasn't been happening that long, and, and it's speeding up. And your arrival, for example, and your ability to integrate these things for the medical school and for the university in general might be extremely valuable to facilitate research at a speed and probably at a cost that, that you know, they don't enjoy right now. Um, but I, I wonder this, though, as a kind of closing question, if you will, Avram. You know, you identified this kind of software as different, say, from business software or business management software, because this kind of software is, is dedicated to creativity, to new ideas. Um, but I wonder, I, I would guess that the expansion of this kind of software has gone from, say, pure science to something bigger to cover technology, cover manufacturing, uh, cover the application of science to technology and, uh, you know, and other things uh, leading to greater productivity. It seems to me that the models that are being designed in the, in the scenarios you have been describing apply not only to science, or will apply not only to science and then technology, but they'll be right back to creative management of everything in the world, uh, including environment, including government, uh, including everything that supports our society. I mean, I don't think it's going to stop here. It's too, it's too powerful for it to stop here. Do you, what's your reaction to my thought on that? I believe that that vision of yours has significant merit, <coughs> but that it can, excuse me, it cannot come about unless there are people with the domain knowledge of the particular areas that can communicate it well. Meaning that, uh, and this is against what some people have regarding ideas and computers. You cannot just take a good computer developer and turn them loose in any field and have them write a good program for it. You need people who have mastered the domain that it's being written for as partners in the process, and these people need to have the systems design knowledge as well. Well, it strikes me, too, then, that, that you, you know, I, I actually, I totally agree with you, and I compare this to the way a computer science program, uh, say at Stanford, has evolved over the past decade or two. You know, before you learn uh, a language and it would be an all-purpose programmer, now you can get a PhD in color schemes on the interface, a PhD on color schemes on the interface. I mean, it has gone to a level of specialization we would never have, never have imagined. And so I say, you know, in response to your thought about different domains, different experts on different scientific domains, it seems to me that's coming. That's part of this. That will enable this to happen, don't you think? Yeah. Um, I hope it happens. I do see it happening more, but I also see and by the way, um, there's another person I'd like to mention here because he's written some very interesting pieces on historical issues which show us where things sometimes don't work. He's a professor in Indiana. Um, his last name is Ensmenger, E-N-S-M, I believe it's M-E-N-G-E-R. And he writes about the history of how computer software as a profession developed. Very interesting stuff. Just look up his name. And the point I'm making is 
the development of what people who wrote software, what they were supposed to be about and what they did, has been guided significantly by corporations attempting to figure out how to turn software into a commodity. Because that's what companies do. Sure. And when this kind of software development bumps up against what's needed to develop really interesting applications, it doesn't necessarily work well. And there's a constant friction between these two sides. Now, of course, the modern Silicon Valley companies like Google or Apple have their own ways to mediate between the um, creative side and the management side. And they've come up with a lot of interesting ideas that have percolated through. Well, you know, I, I, I hope our conversation isn't, isn't finished because I would like to continue it with you, Avram. Uh, there's, there's, it seems like every time we get off on a point, it leads to another two or three points. And uh, I really enjoy this kind of exploration with you. And I can't wait till you get here so we can talk in person. Uh, that's Avram well, Goodblatt of Stratocore, coming soon yeah. to Hawaii. And we've been talking about software for the sciences which I think uh, through him may be a great contribution uh, to all of the medical and scientific research that is being done and will be done in Hawaii. Thank you so much, Avram. Thank you. We'll talk soon. Aloha. Yeah, okay. Oh. Okay. Well, that was a pretty good discussion.